folks? You like blood, violence, freaks of nature? Well then go watch Rob Zombie's House of a Thousand Corpses. But before you watch it, check out this film review. Because, hey, if you're gonna listen to a film analyzation, might as well be from a guy made up like this. So yeah, final JMC review of October, and... With Halloween just a few days away from this video's release date, I thought I would review what is... one of the most... in-your-face halloween e movies that I've ever seen. House of a Thousand Corpses by Rob Zombie. And as you can see, I've made myself up to be like this film's main character, the psychotic killer clown, Captain Spaulding. Now before I get into House of a Thousand Corpses, here's a little info about Rob Zombie for those who have been living under a rock for the past 25 years. Rob Zombie, born Robert Cummings, is a heavy metal musician turned film director. Now, as I think I've said, I'm not the biggest music guy. I do love a lot of music, whether it be scoring or songs. But I'm not a big fan of any particular group or person. I just hear a song in a movie and then I like it. But I have bought some music throughout my life and some of it has been Rob Zombie's and well, I wouldn't call myself a die-hard fan of his music, I do really like his songs a lot. My two favorites being More Human Than Human and Living Dead Girl, which many movie buffs will know as the song from the opening credits of Bride of Chucky. I just love it. And after being one of the biggest heavy metal stars of the 90s, Rob Zombie just decided that he wanted to make movies and... He's also a very huge film buff in his own right. He is particularly, despite the extreme violence of his movies, a much bigger fan of the more classic horror films like Universal's Dracula, Frankenstein, The Wolfman. My man. But yeah, he loves those movies and you can really tell when you watch his films and his music videos. In House of a Thousand Corpses, the movie takes place over October 30th and the 31st, and throughout the film we see characters watching a Halloween movie marathon, kind of like the uh, creature feature stuff that was also, that was a real show, but was also featured in John Carpenter's Halloween. And here we get a very good looking creature feature show called Dr. Wolfenstein's. And with a horror host made up with a vampire-ish or werewolf-ish makeup. All black and white, very noir-ish looking. And it's only a few moments throughout the film, but it's pretty fun to look at. And the titular horror host is played by the film's production designer, Greg Gibbs. Who does a pretty fun and enjoyable job as the late night host. And Rob Zombie himself has a brief cameo in the film as Dr. Wolfenstein's assistant, who we see in the very first scene of the film, smashing a pumpkin with him. And anyway, during this Halloween Eve, as they call it, movie marathon, ah! we see clips from many Universal classics, such as The Old Dark House, the Wolfman and House of Frankenstein playing. And even though it's not part of the Monster Marathon, we see the film's main villains watching an episode of The Monsters later. For those who don't know, it was a mainly comedy, horror comedy show from the 1960s about a family of monsters who are completely unaware that the whole world sees them as monsters. And the episode they're watching is where the Dracula-esque vampire character, Grandpa, enters a drag race with a coffin car called the Dragula. It's Halloween. Might as well finish off my Ghostbusters Twinkies. And because I was too dumb to ever say it in any of the tasting videos I did, that's a big Twinkie. 
View it while you can. All green. Mmm. Tasty. Anyway, before I get too off track, I already probably have a little. The movie's plot is pretty simple. It's basically a the standard uh, dumb kids wander into rural area and wind up at the mercy of a bunch of killers. The movie's plot is very similar to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which Rob Zombie is a huge fan of. And the film's editing style is it lets you it lets you know this was definitely made by someone who had had a career in music theatrics and quick editing video styles. The editing in House of a Thousand Corpses is pretty similar to the movie Natural Born Killers by Oliver Stone, and I think the best way to describe House of a Thousand Corpses in a simple one sentence is like how Natural Born Killers was called an acid trip version of Bonnie and Clyde. House of a Thousand Corpses is like an acid trip version of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And a pretty good one. After opening with Dr. Wolfenstein's commercial, we also get an ad for Captain Spaulding's Museum of Monsters and Madness. And Captain Spaulding is a clown who runs a horror-themed uh, gas station along with some knickknacks and a, I guess, haunted house ride, which is basically a tour of a bunch of animatronics that are based on some of America's most well-known serial killers. And he gives some, like, history with his, with his own creepy touch about what exactly these killers have done. And after the commercials, we cut to Captain Spaulding's place, where we meet the clown himself, played by the great Sid Haig. And uh, he's chatting with a local, I guess, buddy of his named Stucky, played by Michael J. Pollard. They're just having a casual conversation, vulgar, politically incorrect, very 1970s, which I forgot to mention, that's the decade this movie takes place in. And while they're talking, two robbers come in, but one wearing a ski mask and one wearing a monkey mask. And they try to stick up the place, putting on these gruff tough guy acts. The one wearing the ski mask is like, Hand over all the cash and I might leave your brains inside your skull! And Captain Spaulding, throughout this scene, never shows any sign of intimidation. He either keeps his cool or just fires back at them. And when the guy points the gun in his face, he's still not scared. He grabs a piece of chicken and says, I'll tell you what, Ski King, why don't you take your mama home some chicken, and then I want to put my boot all up in your ass. And then the guy's like, I don't like chicken, and I hate clowns. And then he's like, Ehh. And the guy then fires a shot at the ceiling, which causes plaster to rain on him, and then he yells, I'm gonna count to three! And he's like, one! And Captain Spaulding's goes, Fuck your mama! Two! Fuck your sister! Three! Fuck your grandma! And then all of a sudden, this big guy, played by Erwin Keyes, and the character's name is Ravelli. Ravelli comes in and just smashes the ski mask guy with a sledgehammer. And then Captain Spaulding pulls out a gun and shoots the other guy right in the head. And after killing him, he holds the fresh hot barrel up to his nose and just inhales. Like it arouses him. And then he goes over, steps on the ski mask guy's chest, and then just shoots him, fires every shot he has into the guy's face. It's a pretty brutal intro, 
There's a lot of good humor to it as well. There's some suspense, and through small bits of dialogue we get just enough information to understand the personalities and a little bit of the backstory of most of these characters. Whether or not someone will be able to sit through this movie all depends on how they react to the first five minutes. Hardcore horror fans will definitely be able to sit through it, and I don't know if every horror fan will like House of a Thousand Corpses, but I know that they will be interested by the opening scene enough to stay to the end. Pussy bitch wimps, on the other hand, uh... I'm just gonna say right now, it feels pretty lonely being the only horror fan in my family. And after that awesome opening scene, we get this very fuzzy, very uh, aged film looking opening credit sequence. It's a montage of a bunch of bizarre stuff that I can't really make out with a Rob Zombie song playing over it. It's very cool, it's very fun, it's very engaging, and then we are introduced to our other main characters. A group of what I would assume are 20-something-ish young adults who everybody calls kids. And when they are introduced, they pass by a truck pulling a giant billboard that has written on it, God is dead. And someone saying, if you want to give your life to God, raise your hand. And also, a giant billboard saying God is dead. Can't prove anything. But, I wonder, did the filmmakers who did God's Not Dead get any inspiration from this movie? Probably not, but with that film and its sequel having come out over the past few years, anything is possible, I guess. The four main kids of this film are Denise Willis, played by Aaron Daniels, her boyfriend, Jerry Goldsmith, played by Chris Hardwick, and another couple, Bill Hudley, played by Rain Wilson, from The Office, and his girlfriend, Mary Knowles, played by Jennifer Jostyn, J-O-S-T-Y-N. They all appear to be very young and uh, not from the rural areas, like they could come from the cities or from uh, less lower class areas. And they are apparently on a road trip, stopping at local bars, restaurants, and attractions and planning to put it into a book about places to stop when you're on the road. And, lo and behold, they arrive at Captain Spaulding's gas station, where they are immediately taken in. The boys more, the girls not so much. And through their for initial conversations with Captain Spaulding, you kind of get the gist of these characters. They're kind of stuck up, they are, don't come from rich backgrounds, but at the same time, they are probably better off than the people of this area are. And they look down on these people as if, not in, a, not in the worst way, I think, but just they see people like Captain Spaulding as a bunch of dumb yokels. And while Captain Spaulding is a sadistic killer, these kids are just stuck up, condescending, and basically the type of college-ish kids that you just want to punch in the fucking face. They're basically the kind of kids that there are friends with a friend of yours, and then said friend tries to introduce you to them, and you find you can't really stand them. But you put on a nice face. Captain Spaulding, at first, seems like he's not gonna put up with that shit. And he acts all crazy and intimidating with his makeup on. And they retract like they should in fear, and then he makes them think it was a joke. And then Captain Spaulding gets the kids to go on his murder ride. 
where, once I said before, they see a bunch of animatronics of famous serial killers, such as Albert Fish and Ed Gein, the man who inspired the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And the ride ends with Spaulding showing them off what is supposed to be the town's local famous killer, who is the only one on this tour that's fictional, and the killer that he shows off is someone who got the name Dr. Satan, who Spaulding says was a surgeon at a mental hospital, and conducted illegal experiments on the patients and was hung for what he did. And then he talks about how the hanging tree is about a mile or so away. And Jerry decides he wants to go out and see the tree. And Spaulding, who appears to be very reluctant, draws him a crude map to the tree. And while they're driving off, the kids pick up a hitchhiker in the rain, played by Rob Zombie's now wife, Sherry Moon Zombie, or she was known back then, Sherry Moon. She plays a woman named Baby Firefly, and while driving out to the tree, the car breaks down. So they have to go with Baby to her family's house, where we meet all the other Fireflies. Mother Firefly, a very tasting, if not dental hygienic looking MILF played by the late great Karen Black. In fact, Almost half of the main players of House of a Thousand Corpses have passed away since the movie came out back in 2003. And the other Fireflies are Tiny Firefly, played by the late and seven foot four or five tall actor Matthew McGrory. Grandpa Hugo, played by Dennis Fimple who died before the movie was even released, and as such, the film is dedicated to his memory. Rufus Firefly, a tow truck driving, raccoon skin wearing motherfucker played by Robert Allen Mukes. And while there, it becomes clear the Fireflies are very not normal. During one scene, we get Mother Firefly holding a jar that contains apparently a stillborn fetus belonging to her, which she talks to and calls my little baby. And Rain Wilson as just, he perfectly says the best reaction, oh my god. Yeah, they're a very twisted family, and no surprise, it's revealed that they are a group of sadistic killers, and hence the title of the film. It's revealed that they have been collecting many people over the years, and there are literally hundreds and hundreds, eventually a thousand bodies, some alive, some not, under their house, their property. And from there it becomes what I guess you would call a torture porn movie. Mm. I think the whole torture porn craze or the phrase itself first came around with House of a Thousand Corpses. I think it was the first to really uh, start this thing. Because there's a lot of scenes of the four main kids locked in this house and we see them getting brutally tortured. And it's very, it actually is pretty grisly to watch. It's very well done and Rob Zombie, either because the censorship wouldn't, the MPAA wouldn't allow it or he thought it would be best not to show it graphic in every single frame, was able to make these scenes very well disturbing even by cutting out some of the actual contact between the torture devices and the actual characters.
and this almost endless night of torture and death leads the few surviving kids to meeting the actual Dr. Satan, played by Walter Phelan. And that is pretty much the whole gist of the plot of A House of a Thousand Corpses. And any more, I feel, would just be big spoilers, and I know I often spoil, but I feel if you haven't seen this movie yet, you should definitely check it out. I really love this movie, if you can't tell. I mean, I did all this. And to give you an example of how much I love it, many years ago, I went camping. I never intend to again. And I, a good sign that I'm not cut out for camping is I brought a portable, little portable DVD player with me because I just couldn't go without movies. And anyway, what I'm saying is one of the movies I brought with me on this camping trip is House of a Thousand Corpses and I was very limited in how much time I could watch my movies because there was no fucking power at this fucking campsite. But I watched House of a Thousand Corpses in a reclining camp chair uh, late at night with the stars above me. Gotta salvage every last drop of my ecto cooler. And. It's very, it is definitely one of the most halloween -y movies I have ever seen. And it's just full to the brim in your face. Halloween, 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 Halloween. And no doubt, horror fans definitely have a lot of other movies that they have lined up for Halloween night. Unless they're getting drunk, getting laid, getting high, or gorging themselves on as much sweets as they can. But, House of a Thousand Corpses is definitely a movie that I think should be watched during the Halloween season. The whole film just feels like a huge love letter to the holiday of Halloween. And while I do love it, I will acknowledge that there are a few flaws to it. Mainly being its editing, which... Well, not terrible, is very uh, wild all over the place. But then again, it is a wild all over the place film. Just its editing is a little much to take in the first time and even the, around the fifth time. And also the transitioning from one scene to the next, especially when it goes to a different location, is not the best. It was Rob Zombie's very first movie, and definitely feels like the work of a first-time director who hadn't yet fully mastered uh, his craft. It's not bad. I do love it a lot. I think it's a great uh, Halloween movie. It's not perfect, but it is a great experience. And it, let, it helped get us ready for the next film on his lineup. The Devil's Rejects. And as I said earlier, it's kind of like a Texas Chainsaw version of Natural Born Killers. The editing is just all over the place. There are tons of cutaways to what look like TV bumpers from the 70s. Uh, just random shots of the ki killer family. And doing other stuff. A lot of grisly stuff. And on some level it works, on other it feels a little much, and th but there is a good reason for that. There was a lot of problems during the making of this film. First, Universal, who was originally producing it, or going to distribute it, dropped the film because they thought it was just uh, too violent to market. And the movie was actually filmed in the year 2000, but didn't get a release from until 2003. And there was actually quite a lot of rewrites and reshooting going on throughout the whole production, to the point that a lot of the original story had been changed, including an entirely different ending than what was originally intended. 
And I guess you could say it's kind of a miracle that Rob Zombie was even able to finish and release this movie. Let's get to the crew. Obviously, written and directed by Rob Zombie, and, well, a little clunky, he did a decent enough job on his first film. Produced by Andy Gould. Edited by Catherine Himoff, Robert K. Lambert, A.C.E., and Sean Lambert. The costume designs were done by Amanda Friedland, and as I said, the production design by Craig Gibbs. One of the best aspects of this film is definitely its costuming, which has is very Halloween-esque and very 70s-esque. And the production design is amazing, especially towards the final third, which, although a bit absurd in what they show, I mean... I don't think I need the spoilers for this. We see an underground lair that looks too good to have been made by a random group of deranged serial killers. But this film is all, all meant to be just a big fun ride, very all over the place, so I'll let that, I'll let that little leap in logic go. The music, obviously, was done by Rob Zombie himself. Guess he's trying to emulate John Carpenter. And a guy named Scott Humphrey. And all the very graphic and grisly looking special effects are done by a guy named Wayne Toth. I think he deserves a good rock on and thumbs up for all the good bloody scenes he gave us. The main players, Sid Egg as Captain Spaulding. Sid Egg is just great, and a lot of people are probably wondering, for those who haven't seen it, what exactly is the connection between Captain Spaulding and the Firefly family? Because Captain Spaulding's marketed as a big part of the film, but the whole thing with the kids being taken by the family, he doesn't really play any part in that. And at times it almost feels like there are two different movies going on. It isn't until The Devil's Rejects that you finally see the connection that he has to the family. And all the actors as the kids are good. Jennifer Justin as Mary. She does a great job playing a very easy to hate bitch. She's just very stuck up and sneery and rolling her eyes that you just can't wait for her to get it. Rain Wilson is Bill. Very obnoxious, and you don't feel the least bit sorry when he gets what's coming to him. Chris Hardwick is Jerry. He's very obnoxious, maybe a little annoying, but he does a great job, and he's a lot of fun. And he's one of the few characters you really feel sorry for. And Aaron Daniels as Denise. She is, without a doubt, the only likable of the four kids in this movie. She does a great job, and I definitely like this character, and the scenes of her in terror are probably the scariest parts in this whole film. They're just so well shot, and this film does a lot of great work with darkness and limited lighting. Something that's extremely hard to do, but... And anybody who gets nervous being outdoors in the dark will really get the chills watching these scenes. And someone I did not mention when describing the Fireflies, who is a huge like, the second biggest actor in this film, but better late than never, is Bill Mosley as Otis Driftwood, who is, I guess, uh, the unofficial member of the Firefly family, not related to them by blood, but he is considered part of the family. He is a Charles Manson wannabe motherfucker who takes in, tortures a bunch of kids while trying to spew off some 
uh, twisted philosophy about how humans got it coming, and how we're all boxed into our minds. He's obviously based on Charles Manson when you come down to it. A killer who Rob Zombie apparently has a very big fascination with. Bill Mosley, the look they gave him in this is just, he is just so dirty and creepy, it's, it's terrific. He pretty much leads most of the film. And Sherry Moon Zombie as Baby Firefly. I guess normally she would, she plays the type of character that would annoy me to fucking death. But when compared to a character like Mary, you find that Baby is definitely one of those killers who you're rooting for to kill the fucking kids. Kind of like Freddy Krueger. And Baby, she, she's very loud, obnoxious, and giggly, like a dumb valley girl stereotype. But she is a legitimate threat, and once again, in Devil's Rejects, Stuff that was probably wrong with the this film, she is made much better, such as Baby getting a lot more depth. But here, while she is annoying, she's a very good killer. And I guess that's why you kind of... And I don't know if everybody has this same opinion, but for me, I don't find myself exactly rooting for the killers, but, but at the same time... I don't find myself really ha having much hope for the kids, minus Denise. I think it has something to do with the fact that while one group is a bunch of uh, sadistic psychopaths, the kids are, are, put simply, just too rude. Just too rude to root for. And I guess evil just wins over rudeness and snobbery. All the actors here do an extremely well done job. Sid Haig and Bill Mosley and Aaron Daniels are definitely the best. And because I feel everybody deserves a little credit, we get a bunch of the stereotypical tough or dumb or both cop characters who are Deputies George Wydell, played by Tom Towles, and Steve Nash, played by the growing more popular every year, Walter Goggins. We have Denise's dad, played by Harrison Young, and Bill Mosley and Sherry Moon Zombie actually play second characters in these films as well. Sherry has a brief moment where she plays a mother pushing a baby stroller on Halloween well, amongst other trick-or-treaters. It's only for about three seconds, but uh, you'll notice her. Uh, it's before we see Denise's dad. We see this woman just pushing a stroller. It's Sherry. And Bill Mosley. During the Monster Marathon, we suddenly cut to a news report from this 70s mustachioed, combed over, haired guy who's like, Good evening, I'm Lance Brockwell. And then he talks about some high school cheerleaders who have gone missing. Wonder why. And it's a pretty cool cameo when you find out that it's Bill because. He is completely unrecognizable. I mean, both roles are mostly him being in makeup, but the second small character is pretty cool knowing it's him. You just, it, his voice, his face, you just can't tell. And that is the main majority of my review of House of a Thousand Corpses. There is so much more I wish I could say, but I'm a little tipsy right now, and I struggle to keep these videos at a certain time limit, so I think I'll just about wrap this up by saying that if I had to give this flawed but very enjoyable film a rating, I would give it 7.3 out of 10. And for anyone saying that's too low, I think we're all entitled to some opinions. 
And if you want a much bigger and much more in-depth review, because I'm pretty sure this was just uh, another kind of waste of time, but I try my best, then I say check out the two-part video review of House of a Thousand Corpses by the horror film reviewer of Channel Awesome, Count Jacula. Trust me, if you have seen House of a Thousand Corpses, you will really appreciate his review. And I recommend that everybody who loves horror and Halloween who hasn't seen it, check this movie out. And that's all I can really say. Have a happy Halloween, and until next time, my movie niggas, and sing it to me, dance for me, living dead.